I have told some of my friends that I was going to be talking to you today and everyone that I've told, a few people have worked with you before, either been on tours or taken photos of you like at your house. And they've all said the same thing that you are such a sweetheart, <laughs> they, that you're the nicest guy and like, don't be scared. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I have that to calm my anxiety a little bit. So, no worries, honey, no worries. Again, this is an honor and thank you for, yeah, for chatting with me. Of course, Morgan, thank you for calling. Have you seen the doc? And, and what was your relationship with uh, David Wexler, the director? You know, I, I haven't seen the final cut yet. It was a very difficult time for me when David, you know, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. My entire world tour was canceled on March 12th a year ago. So that was very concerning. It was going to be the biggest tour I'd ever done. And so it was a huge, scary loss. And at that time when when I said, OK, and we started talking, you know, I was in pretty fragile, freaked out space. So it was kind of difficult for me, but I I worked with David. He was great and, and we did the best we could. I saw it and it's fantastic. So I think you will be pleasantly surprised when you get a chance to see it. Oh, thanks. Do you have a visual style in mind before you start to write? Like, do you have a mood board? Do you kind of collect images and base your your tracks and your songs off of that or how do you kind of start it's all in my head um morgan you know i have this huge archive of tape loops which i started making out of the airwaves from music radio which was just everywhere and the 80s in new york tape machines slowing things down looping and creating just this huge library of sounds, which were my sounds. And, you know, I've continued to use them throughout my career. When I start to feel like, mm, you know, there comes a point where it's like, oh, you're pregnant. You need to have a baby. <laughs> you know, so, something's wanting to come out. So, <laughs> so then I, I get in there and I, you know, maybe something will pop up and it's like, oh, I wonder wonder what will happen if I go with this. So in a way, it's like painting, like painters. You've got a blank canvas and then you, okay, I'm going to, you know, put a line on there and then we'll see where it goes, see where it takes you, you know, because it's, it's just very intuitive and I just have to follow my instincts. Right. Yeah. Well, and with disintegration loops, capturing the 9-11 footage like that in and of itself, that pairing is just so, I can't picture anything else that fits so perfectly. When you when you got the footage, you put it into, I think iMovie, was it, yeah. to, to uh -huh. edit it? Yeah. Was that something you knew that was so special kind of immediately? Well, I mean, we had just sat there the day before and watched the whole disaster, unbelievable, you know, mind boggling thing happen. And we were all in shock. And I, you know, like I told in the film, I, I managed to, get a cassette, a videotape, and my friend had a camera and she let me put it in on her rooftop. And I just told her, just let it run out. And you know, I framed it. She helped me frame it up the way I wanted. And we just, I managed to capture the last hour of daylight as, you know, day turned to night that day, the world changed. I picked up the tape the next morning and imported it into iMovie and then put the first disintegration of 1.1 on there and I just knew immediately oh my god this is an elegy you know this is whoa you know so I decided after pairing up disintegration loop 1.1 with the the film of the night before um yeah I thought hmm how is this going to work, you know? And then mm -hmm. I decided I'm going to use frames, four frames for the uh, album covers. I, you know, no one knew who I was really then. I'd only had a couple of very obscure recordings out by that point. And I was already $30,000 in debt and I couldn't afford to do a box set because also no one knew who I was. And so I decided I'd release them one at a time and I would use four stills from the film as the 
as the covers and that's how that all came about. It was the pitchfork rating, the perfect 10 that kind of catapulted you, which is incredible. Um, I'm curious if you, so, well, let me backtrack a little bit. So I write for, and I founded Cinemacy, which is the outlet that I'm doing this for right now. And it's an indie film website. And we don't necessarily believe in rating movies just because we think everything that is made is a miracle. Like the money, the time, the effort, everything should be celebrated for what it is, which is like a feat that it exists. And yeah, well, that's what I'm curious. Like the Pitchfork 10 obviously changed the trajectory of your career. Um, but do you, do you believe in ratings and, and awards and, and those things? Oh, I don't know. You know, that's not my call. People have their jobs and critics do their thing. You know, you just have to put your head in the guillotine and sometimes you get to keep it, you know. Mm-hmm. You have yeah. to finish, finish the work, let it go and see what happens. I knew when everything happened in my studio, that it was a mind boggling work. And all my friends came over and they're like, oh, my friend, wonderful artist in New York. He grew up in Coney Island. He has this great Coney Island accent, Howard Schwartzberg. Now he was really smart guy. (laughs) You think he was just a Coney Island dumbass, but he's not, he (laughs) went to art school. He studied, you know, French deconstructionism and knew everything about everything, which I didn't even know because I didn't go to art school, but um, Billy, this is it. You've done it. He said that right after we listened to the whole five hours and he knew and he was right, you know, so the critics had something to dig into. And, you know, it's, that's, that's the way it is. You know, that's the way it happened. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. There was a really interesting quote, I forget who said it in the film, but they said something that there's a risk of connecting work to tragedy because then people will you know, automatically kind of relate those two forever. Um, but I'm kind of wondering if you have a different perspective in a way, like, do you think that a lot of great work is born out of pain and suffering? Well, you know, artists are, living in the world, you know, there, there's a hummingbird in my feeder right now. <laughs> Got a customer. <laughs> and um, so, you know, how can you not be affected by what goes on? You know, you want to say something in your own language, in your own way. You know, on 9-11, everything changed. The meaning of everything changed. Also at that time, we were all frantic then to You know, I didn't know what I could do. I wanted to make sandwiches or something and take them down to the thing, but it was all shut down. You couldn't do that. And I just realized you you can do your work. That's what you have to do. Do you have any advice for musicians and non-musicians to learn how to listen to long form ambient music intently? Well, No, I don't have any advice for people. I think that kind of work gets discovered and then you either like it and you want more or you can't deal with it. Sometimes as people mature and their tastes mature, they can find a way to fall in. And I know, especially it seems during this pandemic year, a lot of people have really kind of gotten into ambient music and to find ways of chilling out a bit, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So, you know, give it a try. If it's not for you, maybe later, you know? Yeah. Well, and to that end, has there been anyone that you've discovered or any new artists in this kind of ambient world that, that you're into right now? Oh, God. Um Many, I've had a chance this year since I'm not touring to listen to a lot of new work, especially uh, on Bandcamp, music by friends and colleagues that I may have met on the road, 
I'm not a name dropper, so it's it's hard for me, but um, you know, <clears throat> Richard Chartier is brilliant. His pink courtesy phone stuff is way out there and really, really terrific. The thing about this great Bandcamp platform is people can <clears throat> do it themselves and mm -hmm. see what happens and promote it on social media and put the word out and you never know. It's a great way to start for young people. Yeah, truly. I'm curious about your daily flamingo check. How's he doing? She? She, how is she doing? Let's go check. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Oh, there went a hummingbird. She's like, I was trying to get my lunch. Sorry, hummingbird. There's yep. the pinky hurting her little eggs around. <laughs> what a life. You see the eggs down there? In the pool? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Three little clear balls. She, she herds them around. It's really fun to watch. Oh, that's good. Thank you for showing me that. <laughs> She's having a good day. Yeah, well, I see it on Instagram all the time. And so now I've, I've now that I feel like I'm, I have this stronger connection to her. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, this was great. Yeah, just a quick little chat. I, I really, really loved the film and of course, all of your work. And um, thank you for everything that you do. And um, yeah, I guess have a great rest of the day and South by experience. Thank you so much, Morgan. Cool. All right. Bye. Bye now.